At the A4ID climate change event on Tuesday the 25th of September 2012, Christoph Schwarter of the Legal Response Initiative delivered an overview of the legal framework regulating mechanisms to address loss and damage due to climate change. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Christoph. I head the Legal Response Initiative for those who don't know us. Um, we are essentially a network of lawyers that advise these developed countries and other climate vulnerable countries in the international negotiations on climate change. Um, and what I wanted to do today is essentially give you a very brief overview on the issue of loss and damage, because my understanding is this event today is mainly about microinsurance, but um, I think the angle you're coming to it is, is loss and damage and the debate that's taken place in the international climate change negotiations over the last two years. And I very quickly wanted to say something about the science related to loss and damage, then the law, possible responses, and um, what's been happen happening in the UNFCCC process. And finally, raise some of the issues that I think are most, most important potentially at the moment. In, that is um, from the last report of the International Panel on Climate Change. The clim as, as most of you probably know, the panel found that there is a 9 in 10 chance that human activities have significantly contributed to climate change and global warming. And this chart outlines some of the effects and the results that we can expect. Um, depending on the overall temperature rise, they'll be different and the more the temperature rises, the worse it'll eventually get. And if the temperature rise stays below the two degrees Celsius target, that's currently um, the main focus of the international community. And I should maybe say at this stage that the countries we work with still wanted to be 1.5 degrees Celsius, but no one really talks about that at the moment. So just to pick two events or two potential scenarios, for instance, that if temperature rise stays at two degrees or below two degrees Celsius, then um, the panel found many countries will be affected by extreme weather, weather events. And uh, it is also projected that, for instance, Africa will be exposed to an increase uh, of, of, of water stress. And since the report came out, there have been other studies and um, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, for instance, estimated that um, 20 million people are likely to be displaced um, by sudden onset climate related disasters. That's basically hurricanes and other um, major events. And then the uh, foundation that Kofi Annan set up brought out a report estimating that there are already 300,000 deaths throughout the world um, every year related to climate change. And um, the UNFCCC secretariat, for instance, suggested that the costs of adaptation to climate change will be something like 70 to 100 US billion US dollars per year. Um, other scientists say it'll be a lot more. I think these are all guesstimates. No one really knows. But there's increasingly the view, and people say that very openly, that major disasters are, at least to some degree, related to climate change. So this is a statement by uh, one of the chief negotiators of the delegation of Thailand in uh, the climate negotiations, climate change has definitely contributed to the recent flooding. And um, Sheikh Hasina, the president of Bangladesh, for instance, has, has, has repeatedly stated that it's climate change that threatens um, Bangladesh. And there's no doubt about it. There is clearly a connection. But if and to what degree other factors are also important, and the failed infrastructure policy and the building of dams in Bangladesh also plays a role. That's, I mean, that's very difficult to determine, and I think that's partially what 
the scientific community is struggling with at the moment. And that's why I quickly wanted to mention the um, School of Geographic and Environment uh, at the University of Oxford. And I understand that my Alan has already given a short presentation, so I won't dwell on this. But the little, the little black dots on that map indicate computers that have been involved in the very complex climate modeling Miles and Anders and others um, have undertaken over the last few years. For instance, in order to determine if and to what extent climate change has contributed to the Russian heat wave. And um, if you look at these two statements in scientific journals, one says, not at all. The other one says, yeah, significantly. Um, so that probably is something to be very aware of, that the science behind climate change is extremely complex. And what scientists can offer us at the moment are charts that indicate an increase in likelihood. So the findings they eventually come up with, and you know, it's, 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 it, it's not always reported that way in the media. The media say um, we can now determine exactly the percentage that human activities have contributed to major events. The, the actual find and findings then are, are much more complex. So, so, so what Miles and act, others have actually found is that two-thirds of the current risk that there is a specific heat wave is attributed to the large-scale warming. And then most of the large-scale warming is attributable, attributable sorry, to atrogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So there are quite a few caveats if and whens involved in the attribution of damages. And I think before a court somewhere in the world finds that there is clear evidence and a clear connection to a specific loss or damage, it will still be some time. So what does the law currently say about all this? Um, for the international lawyer, there are essentially two principles that are of relevance here. One is the so-called principle of prevention that is also often referred to as um, the principle of no harm or the pro prohibition of transboundary pollution and and it basically goes back to um, a decision by an arbitral tribunal at the beginning of the last century in a case between Canada and the US there was a trade smelter on one side of the border um, and the pollution caused damage on the other side of the border. And in that case, um, the tribunal held the state under whose control the pollution um, took place responsible. Um, that principle has then subsequently been incorporated in various international law and policy documents, including the Climate Change Convention, the um, Rio Declaration, Stockholm Declaration, um, with a slight amendment that it's not only the environment of other states, but also areas beyond national jurisdiction that are potentially protected. The second principle is um, that individuals, legal entities affected by pollution have the right to prompt and adequate compensation, equal access to compensation. And that principle is probably not well established under international law yet. Um, the International Law Commission has um, further elaborated on the principle and the rights and obligations we derived from it um, as part of its work, but their work essentially is to 
codify existing law, but at the same time also look at how the law can be gradually progressed. So I think at the moment it's fairly aspirational and I think they also reflect this by saying each state should take all necessary measures. And um, the same, I think, is evident from the Rio Declaration, Principle 13, that um, also mainly focuses on the development of national legislation in order to give this principle of equal ac access to compensation some, some kind of standing within the domestic legal order. There are attempts to codify it in international conventions. And in this connection, you could, for instance, mention the Aarhus Convention. However, that usually leaves it to the um, different national legislators to define what the public is. And um, I think the most convincing approach is probably um, the, the protocol under the Convention on the Transboundary Effects of, of Industrial Accidents and Civil Liability. The problem is that so far I think only one country has ratified this convention, which clearly states that you can take a polluter to court anywhere, basically, no matter whether it's at the place of your domicile or where the damage occurred or at, at the seat of the company. But yeah, I think it's for a reason that this protocol has not yet entered into force. And then there are, of course, um, certain funds that have been set up, and you could look at them as state practice, but they are fairly rare. To, to date, they only cover certain incidents, like, for instance, oil pollution or um, nuclear accidents. So I think it's probably too early to really consider this um, a well-established principle under international law. And there are various other legal question marks that come with these two principles. And one, for instance, is um, the, the threshold that the harm has to meet in order to be, or in order to result in the pro provision of, of activities. So, I think so far it's, it's, it's fairly clear it's got to be serious, significant, or substantial in some shape or form. Um, I mentioned the difficulties in attributing damages to a specific activity and the question of causation. Um, the no harm principle or the principle of prevention is essentially rooted in the state's obligation to act with due diligence, to act with foresight and care. When does this start? When, when, when did countries realize climate change was a serious threat to other countries? So I think, again, there are a whole range of arguments you can make. And um, the second principle of prompt and adequate compensation is basically, or has been developed by the um, Commission and uh, academic writers on the basic basics of the principle of non-discrimination. So it's equal access, but if there's no access at all, then that's not necessarily a violation of international rules. What might surprise a lot of you is that it's really not clear whether climate change can be considered transboundary pollution. The leading legal writers on the issue still think it's atmospheric pollution that doesn't necessarily follow the traditional pattern of transboundary effects. And um, they might be partially right. I think they are predominantly wrong. And if you're interested in this, check out our paper on the legalresponseinitiative.org website, um, where we've looked in a little more depth at the different types of pollution, for instance. Then, in international law, you always have the question of justification 
waver or constant? Did, did states that pollute themselves and that develop economically maybe waive their rights to complain about climate change? Is there maybe a balance that you need to strike between the state's right to exploit national resources and the interests of others? So if you're talking about the principle of prevention, the relevance for China or the US might be very different. And then finally, you wonder what kind of relevance the climate negotiations may have. States have entered into negotiations to come up with some kind of new agreement and new solutions. So maybe they've parked temporarily um, all other legal rights and agreed to focus on the negotiation process and the UNFCCC as a lex specialis. So I think there's, you know, there are plenty of legal questions, a lot of stuff for PhDs and um, LLM pieces. This, um, to go back to the initial question of loss and damage, I think we've essentially, in, in the climate, in the climate change negotiation, what you'll find is when you address loss and damage, there'll always be some countries that say, well, let's, let's focus on mitigation. Let's focus on the right or on the obligation of so-called developed countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. That is our primary tool to avoid loss and damage. The other response then is, of course, to maybe accept some of the realities and, and focus on dealing with the risks on promoting resilience, adaptation, and think about disaster, disaster risk reduction. Countries in the past have dealt with major disasters by diverting money from probably not always the military budget, but other budgets into disaster relief. There are various risk transfer mechanisms. I think one, one thing that's Currently, quite popular are these cattle bonds that you specify a certain risk or a certain type of catastrophe, and if it comes to it, then the insurer pays out. That's probably a very, very, very radical simplification. But and then, of course, solidarity, the sharing of burdens. I think that's quite, quite common. This can happen, you know, within the family, the community. The community of states but the way we in northern societies have obviously dealt with catastrophes and risk is through insurance schemes <coughs> and there is probably no reason why insurance can't play an important role in addressing loss and damage some of the barriers of using traditional insurance products in developing countries are picked out of, out of a, a, a fairly comprehensive study. I don't know to what extent you agree or disagree. Attitudes, cultural barriers and education, I don't know, didn't convince me at all. I can see how maybe the lack of data on risk and exposure might stop insurance company from going into a particular market because they just don't know what the risks are. In a lot of developing countries, there's also a complete of lack of risk prevention and disaster relief plans. I mean, that's something um, they've started to put together now, but um, it's, it, it's nothing that compares to um, what the UK or, or Germany, for instance, have. There's a lack of regulations, high transaction costs, allegedly, unaffordability for the poor. Yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the big challenges that, you know, if you haven't got a penny or if your family still survives on a dollar or two a day, then how, how, how would you be able to afford an insurance premium? And then weak financial institutions in a lot of developing countries. So how, how would you set up a direct debit or a regular payment? And um, whenever these problems 
occur in the uh, you know at the international level a lot of a lot of econ economists and lawyers get excited and start start drafting papers and 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 making making suggestions and i think microinsurance schemes are one of these new tools that might potentially be very helpful and um, these are some of the other suggestions whether index insurance maybe it's all related i don't really know enough about insurance and um, some some think tanks have come, have come up with really complex solutions where countries can take up insurance for loss and damage and then at the same time establish a scheme at the domestic level that allows the local population to be protected and this at the local level would happen in collaboration with NGOs or multilateral organizations. <laughs> so I think there there is a lot there are a lot of ideas at the moment. But my my area really unfortunately is the UNF Triple <coughs> C. And um, there I think the debate is slightly limited, partially because and that's you know some kind of standard standard explanation some people provide loss and damage is not actually dealt with under the convention i'm not entirely sure that's right i mean if you look at for instance article 3 paragraph 3 that deals with a uh, precautionary principle you have a clear reference to irreversible damage and then article or eight explicitly mentions insurance. And that is a, a vestige of a proposal made in 1991 by the islands of small island states, AOSID. So the whole debate on insurance loss and damage is not new at all. It's just been ignored for the last let's say almost 20 years and what aosis at the time suggested was that an international insurance pool should be established that should compensate small islands and um, low-lying developing countries for uninsured loss and damage from slow onset sea level rise and that fund should um be established, you know, based on gross national product or greenhouse, historic greenhouse gas emissions. So the idea was that industrial countries, based on their previous conduct and their ability to contribute to such a fund, would um, resource it and then payments would go to those predominantly affected but the the proposal as well as any other reference to loss and damage the principle of prevention historic responsibility um was was essentially killed by um the developed countries in the negotiations leading up to the UNFCCC so the whole issue came up again as part of the Bali Action Plan, and um, following from that, the UNFCCC negotiation process has created a work program to look specifically at loss and damage, and that work program is split into three thematic areas. And I think these areas, to some degree, also reflect the position and interest of different players in the negotiation. So you have a strand that looks at loss and damage associated with adverse effects of climate change and current knowledge on the same. So that's basically fact-finding. While if you look at the next point, 
that's much more forward looking. Look, let's develop approaches to deal with it and maybe potentially think of some kind of international mechanism. And under this work program, some work has taken place in 2012, essentially those four workshops in Addis Ababa, Mexico, and Bangkok, and Barbados. And um, there is a technical paper of the Secretariat that will come out at some point. Countries have to make submissions before the next meeting in Doha at the end of the year. And the and subsidiary body for implementation of the convention is supposed to make recommendations to COP18. And these are the big issues. Well, some of the big issues that um, I think we're facing at the moment. Will this work program continue? At the moment, it's very much being a fact-finding mission. But the important issue is, based on all these facts, can we develop something? Can we develop a mechanism or ideas that um, effectively protect the the interest and rights of um, affected communities in developing countries. I think that's 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 a big question. Um, there's also still a significant argument, I think, behind the scenes, maybe, how we deal with the very different events. Sea level rise, for instance, that gradually affects the territory, the water of a country, and then sudden onset events that, you know, leave very visible and tangible destruction. Do we focus on predominantly public loss, on damage done to countries, to an infrastructure, or small-scale damages? The threats that um, countries face from climate change are very different. I mean, small island states might lose significant part, significant part of their territory. Why in Africa, it would probably be small scale farmers that are predominantly affected. Um, yeah, can we develop some kind of mechanism on loss and damage? And um, how do we, if we talk about loss and damage, how do we cap capture non-tangible or immaterial damage like the, the effects on ecosystem services or cultural heritage and then of course you know if we've got great ideas if we find um, a system to prioritize between different climates claimants and communities where would all the money come from and that's that's my personal point at the end of all these negotiations fail or fail to deliver tangible outcomes and um, solutions that effectively protect the global environment and uh, vulnerable people, then what is our plan B? And on that note, I thought I'd hand over to the experts on microinsurance.